It's my pleasure to introduce our esteemed speaker, Donald Brown, from the Institute of American Deltaeology in Myerstown, Pennsylvania. You may have already heard about Don from his interview and report on NPR in early January, which garnered widespread attention and recognition for his lifelong passion of collecting postcards. Several of my friends shared the article with me and postcard collectors worldwide were suddenly elevated in status. Even my non-collector friends shared their excitement with me knowing that I share the same hobby. Today, we are incredibly fortunate to have Don, who at 93 years old, has been collecting postcards for the past eight decades. We are eagerly anticipating his reminiscences about his early days in collecting, as well as learning about the origins of our beloved hobby. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Don Brown as he shares his wealth of knowledge and experiences on the topic of a lifetime of picture postcards. Don, welcome. Thank you for coming. You're welcome. It's a pleasure. Myerstown's located in, the, in Pennsylvania's Lebanon Valley, midway between Harrisburg and Lebanon and Reading and close to Hershey. I've grown up here 80, and 90 years ago, and I left and I became a Middle Westerner for about two decades, living in Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and at least a dozen years in Michigan. And I came back home to my own state library after I practiced a bit in the Middle West. And here I am today as my retirement project, I decided I would incorporate my large postcard collection and share it for the benefit of all of the rest of us postcard collectors. I, today, my presentation, my presentation has three segments. First is sharing some recent research about two key individuals who gave our modern postcard hobby its birth and also a publication for its growth. In the second segment today, I'll be showing some examples of postcards that re represent collecting strengths in my collection. And then for the final part, the third uh, segment, I'll be sharing information about postcard clubs and the Institute of American Del Deltaeology and we'll have a finale in the rotunda of my state capitol. I'm taking this back to August 20th, 1943. The Second World War was raging on two fronts. Scrap drives and victory gardens were on the minds of citizens at home, at the home front. On the front page of the New York Times that day, an article with the heading, Kennedy's son is hero in Pacific as destroyer splits his PT boat. And of course, we know who that son was. Lieutenant JG, JFK, our future president. On that day, August 20th, 1943, in Lebanon, Pennsylvania, the post postcard bug bit me. My last grandparent had passed away earlier that month. <clears throat> and my aunt and my mother found a shoebox of postcards among the possessions being sorted out and gave them to my cousin and me. We laid out the cards on the parlor rug at 440 North 7th Street and divided them. The first cards we picked out were of the Panama Canal under construction, so vital to the war effort that day in 1943. There were 100 cards of the Panama Canal being built and we each got 50. Uh, here are two of those postcards. The Calabria Cut and the Lock Chamber had Miller Flores. Those 
other 50 cards of the Panama Canal that I shared with my cousin that afternoon came back to me eventually when she got married and lost interest in collecting. I couldn't keep her with it. <laughs> there were tall buildings in Pittsburgh and New York City among those cards in the shoebox that afternoon. These were the cards left the Frick Building and Henry Hobson Richardson's Allegheny County Courthouse. And on the right, the St. Paul and Park Row buildings in Lower Manhattan, Hat, Lower Manhattan looking up Ann Street. Over the next two years, that bite from the postcard boat motivated bicycle rides all over my part of Lebanon County to drugstores and five and dimes in the smaller towns and by bus to the city, hoping to find racks of postcards. The small towns 80 years ago often had five and dime stores. Now there was no driving me around by my dad. It was wartime and gas was rationed. And by the end of the war, I had become a newsboy. And, and in that position, I was able to share my interest in postcards with everybody I came in contact with, especially on Saturday mornings when I collected the weekly bill for the newspapers. All too often, I heard of postcards having been burned or, oh, sorry, they went out with the trash last spring. But then there were also families who showed me their albums of old postcards carefully saved from the decade of the great postcard craze prior to World War I. Frequently, they shared their dupes or gave me a bundle of cards. Well, my high school librarian, who also was a bit very well aware of my interest in postcards, had suggested to go to the public library and read a magazine called Hobbies. And there I discovered ads for postcards that were as cheap as the penny candy down at the, at the corner, corner grocery. One ad in particular caught my attention. That ad was for the Postcard Collectors Club of America, and it read, quote, life membership in the Postcard Collectors Club of America gives you an authentic standing as a member of the nation's leading postcard club, plus association with hundreds of other collectors. Join today. Membership fee, $1, includes roster and 24 postcards. Address, room 807, Public Services Building, Kansas City, Missouri. Now you would guess that I made immediate contact with that address in Kansas City. I, wait, I waited nearly a year to write. There was a reason my TJ, teenage enthusiasm desired postcards from other parts of the United States as quickly as possible. I had been noticing the names of printers and distributors on the address side of cards that had written to a firm in St. Louis, but without success. The next attempt was to the Summit Drugstore in Akron, Ohio. Success. Not only did they send a packet of postcards, but a note was attached, try Woolworths. Therefore, over the next year, I spent my dimes and quarters earned on the paper route to dozens of F.W. Woolworth stores all around America with a desire and that the clerks of the Woolworths often gave the high school student lad with a desire to learn about their city, as I always put it, through picture postcards, a bountiful number of cards. And those orange postage due stamps of the 1940s became all too familiar. <laughs> However, I kept in mind to write to that postcard club address in Kansas City. Finally, in 1946, I wrote and, be and became member 1594 of the Postcard Collectors Club of America and started receiving the issues, the Postcard Gazette. The issue shown here is not an issue I received, or I couldn't have. That, this issue is dated June, July, 1940, and supplied by Peter Megason of Westport, Massachusetts. P. 
Peter and I have been collecting the literature of, of Deltiology, including the bulletins and newsletters of the various postcard clubs for most of our collecting years. In recent years, we have filled in gaps from each other's backgrounds to create a more, more complete run of the different bulletins, the purposes of which is eventually to send them to the University of Maryland Library Special Library Unit, where the archives of the National Trust for Historic Preser Preservation are located, and where postcards from the Institute of American Deltiology have been transferring since 2010. More about that later. By the way, if anyone hearing this, if all of you hearing this Zoom have copies, or you know of anyone, who have copies of the Postcard Gazette prior to 1947, let Hal and the Wich Wichita Club know. That goes for another early publication, the Postcard Collectors Magazine that I will be mentioning shortly. How did the Postcard Collectors Club of America get started? Well, seen here is its founder, Albert H. Wood, lived from 1902 to 19. 85. He's founder of the Postcard Collectors Club of America in 1936. Here is how it came into existence under the guidance of this man, Albert H. Wood of Kansas City, Missouri. On his job as manager of the commercial department of the Kansas City Public Service Company, Mr. Wood had received 16 letters in 1936 addressed to Public Service, Kansas City, Missouri, asking that the writers be, su <laughs> be supplied with picture postcard views of the city. Apparently, those 16 writers believed that the Public Service was some sort of a municipal agency to supply free anything postings Kansas City. Mr. Wood went to the nearest five and dime bought 16 collections of Kansas City postcards and sent them to his correspondents. Then he sent each collector the name and address of the other 15 and believed that he was through with the task. Not, not at all. The postcard fans responded by organizing a club and electing Wood head of it, making him a sort of national clearinghouse for the exchange and supply of picture postcards. Soon he became interested in collecting local postcards himself, finding many possibilities in it. Now specifically who named the club is not known, but under the name Postcard Collectors Club of America, by the mid 1940s, it had been, it had been receiving 50 to 100 letters a week. Now, after a decade of leadership, pressures from his job, and several civic organizations on which he held membership caused Mr. Wood to give the club away. And with, the, and with help from the local American Legion post in Kansas City, the manner in which Albert Wood gave his club away tells us that probably he had been managing the club from his home with the help of local collectors around Kansas City. From obituary of Mr. Woods that Don Rhodes of the Institute staff here provided, we learned that Mr. Ro Mr. Wood was active in a number of civic organizations in Kansas City and in California where he moved later. Actually, he we learned that he became president of several service clubs, well-known service clubs in both cities. He went back and forth between Cal Kansas City and California. And, uh, uh, California. In 1936, he was only 34 years old when he helped form that clearinghouse for a hobby, the Postcard Collectors Club of America. At the time in mid-1946 when Albert Wood exits from our postcard world, and we know that he did so because his name is not listed in the 1946-47 roster seen here nor has any evidence yet turned up in the hobby's literature in the years following 1946 that he made any further contact. Yet, a recognition in some form needs to be made. What a wonderful thing he did for our hobby of Deltiology. 
back in the depression 1930s and through the second world war years. Thank you, Albert H. Wood. Thank your spirit. He had been born in Altoona, PA in 1902, spent at least half of his life in Kansas City and died in Florida in 1985 where, I, where he lies buried in Winter Haven. Well, when Edgar Al Wood gave the club away in 1946, its membership was close to 1,400. I am, mem I am member 1594. So it turns out that by the time I joined in the fall of 46, a transition with the club had occurred and two paraplegic veterans of World War II had been given to the club, had, had been given the club by the local American Legion uh, as Al Wood had requested. I think at this time, what I'm going to do is tell you about some of the collectors on this, that I contacted on this roster. I collected about 40 collectors wrote to me and I wrote to another 40 in the year 46 and 47. And usually we exchanged one card at a time. Happened to have two cards in my hand that I received back in 1947. This one from Carolee McVeigh in Cushin, Oklahoma. If weekly basis would be all right for me, I like historical uh, cards and all, kind, all kinds of cards really, one card at a time. And this card that I received and corresponded with this collector in Texas for about three years, Manoy Farmer of Longview, Texas. Thanks for your very nice card. It adds very much to my collection. I hope you will like this one. Usually what we said to each other, <laughs> there was never a time we didn't like it. This, we disliked any cards. But he said at the, on the card, I exchange only one card at a time. That's because we were, it was the war years and we were in our hometowns and we have to depend on the cards of our hometowns and maybe a nearby town or two that might've had postcards. Uh, later, I'll tell you something interesting that Mr. Henry suggested to me. Mr. Wood gave the club away, back to Mr. Wood and then his successor. Mr. When Al Wood gave the club away in 1946, as I said, its membership was close to 1400. And of course I joined afterwards. Those, the, those two uh, veterans had the club for only a short time because the August issue of the Postcard Gazette contained a, a front page headline introducing your new president and vice president, accompanied by a picture of two World War II, two World War II veterans, C. Ray Mitchell and C Corporal Robert H. Miller, both of Kansas City. However, it seems that these two web veterans were in charge of the Postcard Collect Collectors Club of America for less than a year because in the roster that I received in late winter, 1947, here it is. I thought it was 46, but it was, it was actually after New Year in 47, when the roster came through that was apparently prepared by these two veterans. Mitchell's name, when that roster came through to me, uh, over on this lower right-hand corner, Mitchell's name was crossed off as president and that of Kansas City and Frank Koskar was substituted. I was wondering what was going on. It is at this time, spring 1947, that a more familiar postcard pioneer, more familiar to us through the years, Bob Hendricks of California, comes front and center onto the stage of Deltaology. He had founded a second publication for postcard collectors in 1943. Its first issue was December, 1943. It was called the Postcard Collectors Magazine. It was through that magazine that Bob Hendricks had conducted a campaign for a more scholarly term for postcard collectors, such as the philatelists, philatelists, philatelists had for stamp collecting and the numismatics and the coin collectors had 
numismatics for coin collecting. By November 1944, the term chosen was Delteology. It was announced in his magazine, the Postcard Collector's Magazine in November. Randall Rhodes, a collector from Blanchester, Ohio, down near Dayton, had accepted Hendrick's challenge. Consulted with a reference librarian at Ohio State University, Ethel Miller, who in turn consulted with a classics language professor, Dr. K. M. Abbott, and recommended Delteology. Derived from the Greek word Delteon, a small illustrated tablet or image, and Logos, science or study of knowledge. In May 1947, the Postcard Gazette welcomed Bob Hendricks as editor and also reprinted part of a letter that Hendricks had written to the Postcard Gazette. Quote, I have long been intent on becoming a member and advertiser of your club. I have decided to put an end to the prolonged delay and send my dupes in, dues, do, dues in today, not dupes, dues in today, sometime in late winter or early spring 1947, then, therefore, is the date that Bob Hendricks became involved with the Postcard Collectors Club of America. For the next baker's dozen of months, Hendricks was editor of the two pioneer publications of our hobby until July 1948, when a merged issue of 24 pages appeared with the title Postcard Collectors Magazine and Gazette. That combined title continued until January 1952, when the word Gazette was dropped and the title became Postcard Collectors Magazine. Until by 1956, it was simply postcard collectors. And then later that year, it folded. In case you're wondering whether you will see a picture of Bob Hendricks as you did of Albert Wood, yes, you will. But my program got set up by me in such a way that you will see a picture of me next instead of Bob Hendricks. But I promise you, you'll see Bob also. Here we are in the Postcard Gazette with the title of an article entitled The Younger Set in Myerstown. I've already mentioned how I wrote to dozens of Woolworth stores around America for postcards. At that time, I motivated a few, few other friends to do likewise. One in particular who lived in my neighborhood followed my advice, Raymond J. Phillips Jr. By 1947, we called ourselves the Pennsylvania Postcard Club and wrote to Bob Hendricks, who in response asked each of us to write about our collections and our activities in the club. Consequently, in the spring 1948 issue of the Postcard Gazette, this article appeared entitled The Younger Set in Myerstown. I'm the one on the right. My friend Ray is dark-headed. I was blown. By showing the article to some classmates who had been kidding us about our curious hobby, I'm not so, so sure they all called it that, but <laughs> it was, redemption felt wonderful. I described how we exhibit our, our collections at the local community fair at which 25,000 persons had gotten to view the cores and how we wrote to distributors, quote, distributors, the names we took off the address side of cards. Now, in an editor's note, Bob Hendricks advised against that practice, but to join postcard clubs instead, <laughs> well, that was his crusade. I often wondered if I had said Woolworth stores, might he have agreed? <laughs> Probably not, because he was always encouraging the growth of collector's clubs. And by 1948, there were about a, there were about a dozen. He would list them in the Gazette and in his magazine. Here we see Bob Hendricks looking at some of his rare postcards. Winnowed down, as he said, one time from 100,000 cards to 10,000, and then to these select rare ones that he was proud to show. From editorials he wrote after becoming editor and president of the Postcard Collectors Club in 1947, had Hendricks readily accepted his expanded role as crusader for the hobby. 
He recognized the need and importance of forming local clubs where collectors could share their collections and learn from one another. And for the local clubs, which he was always promoting, for the local clubs to maintain newsletters as clearinghouses for information. From time to time in his editorials, especially during the 1950s, he said there was a need to maintain a central archive or a library of some sort where books about postcards and manuals for their preservation could be available. Now, I'm planning a rereading of those, of his, those editorials in the near past as I write an article about all of this early history of our clubs and the, how our hobby started. And I'll send a copy to the, of course, to the Wichita Bulletin. Here are two Christmas program <laughs> postcards, Christmas postcards from Bob Hendricks. Season's Greetings, 1949, number two of that Postcard Collectors Club of America said, and Seasons Greetings, 1950. The, these two cards are part of that set of 61 cards issued between 1948 and 1953. The 1950 card is the 28th in that set and contains the signature of Bob Hendricks in lower right. He had designed the card. If you look closely, you'll see his signature in the lower right. The print count for each of these cards was 1,000 copies printed locally in Los Angeles. And in recent years, I've discovered there's a growing demand among the younger collectors for this to complete this set. This ends the first segment of my presentation today, sharing what so far has been learned about the granddaddy club of our hobby and its two founders, and his two pioneering publications. Now we'll, uh, we'll see some postcards that represent strengths in my collection. Political campaign cards. Hal, you have more cards by far and more campaign buttons than I ever would dream of having. But I did like political campaign cards and I have at least a box of these. Here we see a postcard issued by the New York Republican State Committee featuring families of the candidates that headed the ticket, the ticket for president and vice president in 1948. The ticket was headed by two governors that year. That was the year I also graduated from, from high school. And that's also the year that Bob, that the, the Bob Hendricks combined his, the two magazines also, 1948, period, an important year, uh, bench year in our postcard world. Well, uh, the two governors were running for president and vice president, Thomas C. E. Dewey of New York State and Earl Warren of California. Here they are with their families. That was the campaign when Colonel McCormick of Chicago and his staff to Chicago Trib were so sure that this would be the winning ticket that they printed an early edition of the Trib announcing Dewey, de Dewey defeats Truman. That was not the case as we know, Truman won. Uh, my collection has a postcard of Truman gleefully holding up that newspaper. And later on this program, I, it might be able to be shown. This is, State Street looking west toward the University of Wisconsin in Madison on a 1957 real photo postcard by the LL Cook Company of Milwaukee. I was drafted into the United States Army tour during the Korean War, serving in South Carolina, Maryland, Fifth Army Headquarters in Chicago, and Fort Snelling, Minnesota. On the GI Bill, I attended the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Seen here, and that's, yeah, there it is. Seen here on a real photo postcard by the Cook Company, and was taken from the dome of the Wisconsin State Capitol, looking west on State Street. This is a card I sent to my parents on which I marked my library school, the Wisconsin Union, and the location of my room. 
which was in a large shingle style house in North Francis Street along Make Lake Mendota, which you see there in the distance. That house was built by historian, well-known historian, Frederick Jackson Turner, well known for his frontier thesis in American history. And after I lived there for about a month, my landlord told me that that was the attic room where Frederick Jackson Turner wrote his thesis. Previously, I had been a graduate history major at the University of Illinois in Urbana. Well, I was totally thrilled. I had, that was the thrill of that year. But I realized I'm more of a librarian than a teacher, so I decided that I would go to library school when I came out of the Army. At library school, well, my special subject focus when attending library school at the University of Wisconsin was the broad field of American architecture. For our materials selection class, we had a T select, we were told to select a subject in which we had never taken a course in high school or college or junior college. But by this time, I was very interested in architectures. I had never taken any course in architecture, still haven't to this day, even though my collection is very, very strong in architecture and architects. Architecture and the built environment, as I said, is a special strength in the postcard collections of my institute. Not far from Madison is located the home of Frank Lloyd Wright at Spring Green, Wisconsin. He is the architect of this structure along the shores of Lake Monona that never got completed until the 1990s. This is Monona, the famous Monona Terrace Convention Center that finally got completed in, in 1999. It was first proposed by Wright in 1938. It got postponed time and again due to disagreements with the mass. Madison City Fathers. One late, at, one late afternoon in the winter of 1957, I was as I was coming out of a restaurant across the street, I saw a person who looked like Frank Lloyd Wright storming out of the Madison City Hall. Next day, the Madison newspaper confirmed that it was Frank Lloyd Wright. The Monona Terrace project had to await for a later generation of Madison City Fathers to be revived. And as I said already, it was completed by 1997. Architecture and architects always have been a fascination of me since I was 20, 21. Wichita also has a Frank Lloyd Wright building. It's the Allen Lamb House, now apparently a museum, and it's located at 255 North Roosevelt. It was designed by Wright in 1915 and constructed in 1917-18 for Henry and Elsie Allen. It is seen on this postcard from its east exterior elevation. And your local photographer, Paul Chauncey, uh, back in 1992, did produce this nice postcard of it. Louis Sullivan is the not noted leader of the first Chicago School of Architecture prior, prior to World War I. His maxim was form follows function as he designed a fleet of jewel box banks throughout the Middle West. Here we see the National Farmers Bank of Winona, Minnesota. It, uh, it had been built in, no, it had been built in 1908 as the National Farmers Bank, but, but by the time of this postcard printed by E.C. Crop of Milwaukee in the mid-1930s, it had become the Security Bank and Trust Company. During the 1960s, I had the occasion to pass this bank from time to time as it was being cleaned and its brilliance restored. It's just beautiful. I did not get inside the bank because they were always, there was always structure around it, uh, polishing the surface, the jewels on the surface. Now here is the Mer Merchants Bank of Winona, Minnesota. William Gray Purcell is the architect here and he should be as well known as Louis Sullivan, but he didn't have the boastfulness of, and he didn't have the boastfulness of Frank Lloyd Wright. <laughs> William Gray Purcell was a leading architect of the Prairie School and a protege of Louis Sullivan. 
practicing in Chicago and Minneapolis, he designed dozens of Harry School structures, especially when in partnership with George Grant Ellsmey, another Prairie School architect that's important to know. William Gray Purcell is best known actually for his writings as he knew all of the architects of his time, which ended with his passing in 1965. Advertising picture postcards are also a strength on my institute. There are boxes and boxes of them, which I'm reorganizing recently. They are not yet in Maryland. Advertising postcards form a large, large segment of my collection. As I said, drawers and drawers, advertising events and services, as well as businesses, industries, and products. Here is a card advertising a Southern Illinois newspaper, the Evening Sentinel, showing many views of its plant and interior, interior offices. Egypt's greatest daily is at the top of the card. And I think some of you know why. Because the city of Centralia, where the Sentinel was published, is in Southern Illinois and cotton is grown there. It's in that same region, region where the city of Cairo, not Cairo, Cairo, Illinois, where the Ohio River meets the Mississippi. Now this postcard is a smooth linen print by Kurt Teich in 1930, done in 1931. Here's another advertising, uh, advertising card of Kurt Teich the largest printer of postcards in America, also has, has made available a selection of convenient items to promote and to sell their cards. This card advertises a postcard display stand available in 1928. The date of this card is determined by the printer's number written on the lower right-hand corner. And I have the guide that the, the Kurt Teich archives has provided to us when they were out at outside of Chicago, now at the Newberry Library. And you see the printer's number there, 122188. One, when I checked it, it, that meant that this card, advertising card, was printed in 1928, advertising a product of that time. The firm started printing, Kirk Dyke started printing in America in 1904 until, and until the 1970s, when the plant closed and was sold. Mr. Tyke had died in 1974. One of his sons arranged for the firm's production archives to be preserved, initially near Wakanda, Illinois, and more recently at the Newberry Library on the north side of Chicago. My collection is also strong in early, has strengths in early American expositions. Here are two cards of the Columbian Exposition of Chicago, in Chicago in 1893. I think all of us here know the birth of the picture postcard in America incurred, occurred in 1893 at that fair, when sets of postal cards with images of buildings at the fair imprinted on the message side of the card were offered for sale. Small blanks, small blank spaces on the image side were left for messages at the top. Here is one of these cards. And a reverse side of another Colombian card is shown at the bottom, postmarked in Chicago during the dates of the fair. Note that this is a governmental postal card. What I'm going to show you in the next two slides are lesser known uh, expositions from, that, from the period before the First World War. Cotton states, an international exposition in Atlantic, Georgia, was con conducted between September and December of 1895, a fall and early, early winter ev event. Chicago's Columbian Exposition of 93 is well remembered by Americans because so many products and organizations were either hatched or first presented there including the Ferris wheel, the symbol for many future fairs. In addition to several sets of postcards issued for the Columbian, 
My collection has strengthened a half dozen or more of the lesser known fairs prior to World War I. How many of us have cars or have heard of the Cotton States and International Exposition held at Atlanta, Georgia in the fall of 1895? Its purpose was to increase commerce for our Southern states, thus diverting Caribbean trade away from the nations of Europe. Next card. And as you look at this, the, the, the reverse side of that card, it's privately printed. It wasn't a governmental postal card. Fewer yet people probably have heard of the South Carolina Interstate, Interstate and West Indian Exposition held in Charleston, South Carolina between December 1901 and 1902. That was another fair held to lure Caribbean and Central American trade away from Europe and to bolster the economy of our southern states. It opened in December 1901 and ran through summer 1902. Many of the exhibitors at the well better known Pan American Exposition up at Buffalo during 1901 simply transferred their exhibits to Charleston. Speaking of this South Carolina fair, my collection contains a, the 10 card set dated 1902 by the Albert and was printed by the Albert Type Company of Brooklyn. And printed as private mailing cards. Ironically, <laughs> the private mailing card ended on December 1st, 1901, but this set was, is printed with the date 1902. Another of my strengths are signed artist cards. Here I have an example by Weinold Rice, an artist who came from Germany as a young age in 1913, after had, having had training in Munich and a passion for the American West. He's recognized as, as a leader of the immigrant modernism in American art. Rice's paintings of the Blackfeet tribe of the Northwest United States and of the leaders, also of the leaders of the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s are best known. This painting of Chief Waves in the Water of the Montana tribe is one of a series of 10 commissioned by the president of the Great Northern Railway when he saw murals, Rice's murals, in a Longchamps restaurant in New York City in the 1920s. Festivals and parades. Here we see the Priests of Palace Parade Flute, 1908, Kansas City, Missouri. Priests of Palace were a Mardi Gras-like festival, but begun by Kansas City businessmen in 1984 to attract tourists to the city. From 1907 to 1910, Colorful sets of postcards were produced to the floats in the annual parade. Seen here is a float from the 1908 parade called People Day, whatever it means. The festival was discontinued after 1912, but it revived again in the 1920s. Festival planners decided that they should be a secret organization. Therefore, a cont contest was held for the most appealing, mysterious name. So what more can I tell you? Handmade postcards, stamped craft. I have about 25 varieties of unique postcards, sometimes made from wood, sometimes from tin, sometimes from birch bark. But we, these were stamped craft made by Nellie Dulovich of Youngstown, Ohio. She tried to match the postmark on the stamps with the location of cities on the map for her 50 state series. Here are the two states where I have lived the longest, Pennsylvania and Michigan. She was well known for her exhibits at the Windy City and Western Reserve Club shows, and also at the All States Hobby Club shows from the 1950s to the 1990s. She also produced dozens of such stamp craft art during the bicentennial 1970s, and also for most holidays, uh, especially her Halloween uh, stamp craft cards and Valentine's are unique. Her collection, I purchased what she had of her collection 
she shared with a lot of people, a lot of collectors, but her collection is located here at the Institute of American Deltaology. Here we see Calvin Coolidge. Here is, seen here are the lamp and Bible used by Ken, Calvin Coolidge to be sworn in as the President of the United States, which occurred at 2.30 a.m. on August 3rd, 1923, when news arrived in Plymouth, Vermont, that President Warren G. Harden, Harding had died suddenly in California. The oath was administered by the President's Father John, a Justice of the Peace in Vermont. Born on the 4th of July in 1972, Nope, 1982. Nope, yes. 18. 18. 18. <laughs> you caught it. Yes, born on the 4th of July in 1872. Coolidge grew up in Vermont, but became prominent in Massachusetts politics, where he became governor by the time of World War I. He served as U.S. president for nearly six years after that death of Harding and was known as Silent Cal, a man of very few words, but decisive actions. When he died, he died on January 5th, 1933 in Northampton, where he had also been the mayor. And when Tallulah Bankhead was told that the president was dead, her response was, was how can they tell? Large letter postcards, 1940s Lennon era. Here's the Southern California Postcard Club, card, done in 1948, and the Providence Rhode Island Club, done in 19, produced in 1943. Although my collection contains some large letter cards from prior to World War I, it's those colorful large letter cards printed during the Lennon era of the 1930s, 40s, and 50s that are most every collector's favorites. Kirk Teich may have been the most prolific publisher of linens, but my collection also con contains many large letters printed by Tickner Brothers, E.C. Crop, and, and by a few other lesser recognized printers, such as the Beals Company of the Des Moines, Iowa. The Southern California Postcard Club large letter was produced in 1948, shortly after the club's founding, and the influence of Bob Hendricks it's very evident from the caption. It says, the club exists, quote, for the convenience and benefit of Southern California deltaologists. And then in parentheses, he puts postcard correcting collector. So he realizes most people in 1948 didn't know the term yet. Hendricks emphasized the use of the terms deltaology and deltaologist at every opportunity. By the 1950s, I had joined the campaign to use the term also. I wasn't too fond of it when I was younger. In 1958, when the new edition of Webster's Dictionary was wheeled into the History and Travel Department of the Detroit Public Library where I worked, I sped over to the dictionary, discovered it was there, and called across the room to my colleagues, I made, it made it. Deltaology is in the, dic in the new dictionary. That was 1949. The large letter card of Providence has always been a favorite of mine. I have, it included, I have included it on an exhibit board called Shazam. You know, those cards featuring league lights. I see a relationship. <laughs> About 20 years ago at, Cra at Cracker Bar Barrel Restaurants in about half of our states, large letter postcards appeared on racks. They are, I have a copy in my hand and you'll see a copy later. They have a smooth finish, continental size and color. They were published by Seek Publishers in Millersville, Tennessee. And I have an idea, most, many of you have heard of these cards. Peter Megason surely has. He specializes in large letter cards and he has supplied about 200 of these to the Institute of American Deltaology. Here we see the North Platte Canteen, North Platte, Nebraska, the Union Pacific Railroad Station on Christmas, 
Christmas night, 1941. Well, this, this view wouldn't be Christmas night, 1949. That's where the canteen started. Here we see the ladies on the home front during World War II, ready to serve the next troop train on the Union Pacific Railroad at North Platte, Nebraska. All trains stopped for 10 minutes to lubricate the giant wheels and refill the tender car with water and coal at the North Platte station, during which time all sorts of baked goods, sandwiches, fruit, coffee, milk, cigarettes, and magazines were shared by folks who came from, from all over Western Nebraska and nearby Kansas and Colorado, starting Christmas night, 1941. The canteen was the entire station that could comfortably hold 600 individuals. In the period between this Christmas night, 1941, and when the campaign, canteen finally closed in April of 1946, 55,000 volunteers from 125 communities kept canteen from never missing a train day and night. Read. Bob Greens, the Chicago columnist, who might be gone by now, but, but be, get Bob Greens once upon a town, the miracle of the North Platte canteen. It was published in 2002. It's well worth a read. And so thus ended the middle portion of my presentation this afternoon. And we'll go to the third and final section which will focus on club, acti club activities and observations made once I joined local clubs and learned from, from being a member. And then at the final, at the end of my presentation this afternoon, I'll mention why I decided to incorporate my growing postcard collection and why the larger part of it is being donated to the University of Maryland Library System. Here's the Wolverine Postcard Club card that was produced in 1961 to advertise the club. Bob Hendricks had joined our club by then. He passed away in 1962. And remember the president the next year, the, well, I think, I guess I got the letter, although I left Detroit and went to Kalamazoo that year. Uh, we got a letter from Bob Hendricks commenting, supporting us for doing a postcard club, just said, like he had done for the Southern California Club uh, some time before. My first full-time job with, was with the Detroit Public Library, and by March 1958, I had become aware of a postcard club meeting across the street of the D Detroit Historical Mu Society Museum. And I attended my first meeting of the Wolverine Postcard Club in the spring of 1958. And by 1960, I had been elected president of that club and was on the way to joining every other postcard club that I knew of. By the end of the 20th century, when clubs in our hobby began to falter, I held membership, I think, in every North American postcard club membership at one time, depending on the quality of their newsletters. <laughs> I held membership in every North American postcard club, three or four in Canada, that wonderful club up there in Toronto, <laughs> who pu publishes a very nice issue of their magazine, has issued a book. Now, uh, anyhow, the count is well over 50. That's what I'm telling you folks. I re so I'll talk now about joining the Wichita Club sometime in late 1979. After having seen a copy of your news and recognized that your club was organized for growth with interesting articles and information about the postcard world, plans for a national an annual show, and with an artist who has served as a mascot for the club, Rick Gary, bringing that mascots bring good luck through the years, helping to make Wichita a leader of the pack early on. Fortunately, there remain today 
a baker's dozen clubs in the US and Canada, pioneering in providing for growth of the hobby with informative newsletters and frontier cutting edge ideas and programs such as today's Zoom, associate, Zoom session. In the Mid-Atlantic, the Washington Crossing Card Collectors Club with Betty Davis as longtime editor is another decades long example of a club consistently sharing and expansing, expanding knowledge in our world of Deltaology. On, west, on the West Coast, until the retirement of editor Lou Bayer, looking for the title. Oh, he, he, he was editor of the Journal of the San Francisco Bay Area Postcard Club. It's a long name, I had to write it down comes to mind for its many decades survival. Lou and Janet visited me several times and had Thanksgiving dinner with me. And I just learned from your Wichita news that Janet died the other day. So my empathy and sympathy to you, Lou. Denver Postcard Club of Colorado that began over four decades ago has been consistent in publishing a sizable newsletter 10 times each year during the 21st century. Beth Talmadge and Chad Daly are current editors. In New England, where there are several long established clubs that issued bulletins and newsletters, there's been a trend toward using email to share monthly activities and news with emphasis upon exhibiting cards at annual shows. My longtime membership in the Rhode Island Postcard Club supports that observation. Recognizing that there remain some thriving new postcard clubs in New York and New Jersey, also I recognize the need to, do, to, to reconnect with some of those clubs. One club that I have kept up with through this monthly newsletter is Garden State Postcard Club, who is the Garden State, whose editor, Chris Wolf, has been compiling checklists on specific New Jersey topics that are published every fall. I call those checklists of postcards deltiographies. If a book list is a bibliography, it's not a postcard list, a deltiography. The law had been somewhat out of touch recently with the South Jersey Postcard Club that John McClintock founded in, the, in 1970. I believe it's still active because the club's longtime editor, Ray Hong, has been a steady contributor contributor of well-researched articles that have been occurring in Bill Burton's online weekly magazine, Postcard History, emanating out of Dover, Delaware the past several years. And it's wonderful again to be able to read articles that George Miller wrote in decades past. 25 years ago, Pennsylvania was home to 10 postcard clubs, but today less than half of these survive. Of the Baker's Dozen Postcard Clubs in the Middle West, in which I have held membership during the, the past 70 years, mainly the Twin City Postcard Clubs by Monte Bulletin is still arriving. Perhaps Cole Woodbury's The Postcard Matters is still being published in the Kansas City St. Joseph region. If so, I will subscribe. On the West Coast, I was a, I had a wonderful journal coming from San Jose, but not in the last two years. So I know you folks that are listening today from that club will send me a membership uh, form so that I can rejoin your club and receive your bulletin if it's, if it's still being published. As I said, the two clubs I was most active in when I lived in the Middle West and the Midwest is always the Middle West to me. I learned it that way as a child from a book called Little Tom of the Middle West. The two clubs I joined, I was active in in the Middle West, Chicago and Windy City Postcard Club and the Wolverine Club of Michigan seemed structured for longevity, longevity but falters when the, faltered when the 21st century arrived. The last Windy City Bulletin I received was in June 19, June 2002. Wolverine's last issue was about the same time in 2003. 
1960, when I served as president of the Wolverine Club, several projects were initiated, including one called Travel Gems, and another, an inventory of the firm's printing chrome postcards. I was only living in, I lived in Detroit only four years. And then I moved west to Kalamazoo by the mid sixties, but I continued to write articles for Wolverine, including a checklist of postcards of buildings designed by Frank Lloyd Wright that I called the Deltiography. Several Wolverine post club members also were active in the Windy City Club and vice versa. The autumn postcard shows in Chicago's Loop in the 1960s were highlights. So I wrote Windy Wolverine reports of activities and displays at the annual show, Chicago Club shows for the Wolverine Club News. Robert C. Finnegan, better known as Bob Finnegan, was the well-known leader of the Windy City Club at that time. He had founded the Chicago Club in August 1948 following a visit with Bob Hendricks to get ideas in Los Angeles earlier that summer. Now, we're at the final slide of my presentation this afternoon. The Institute of American Del Deltaeology, where I am this afternoon, where Dennis is and Don Rhodes and John Frelish. West End of Myerstown, just three or four blocks up the hill from where I grew up 70 and 80 and 90 years ago. This, this photo is of me 20 years ago. <laughs> it's now 80 years since that postcard bugged me, bit me. It didn't just bug me, it bit me. <laughs> Here's where the bulletins, magazines, and newsletters have been gathering from as, as they await transfer to the University of Maryland Library System at College Park. In addition to three or 4,000 postcard club bulletins and postcard journals, there are about a half million postcards here, some of which are dupes of cards already sent to the University of Maryland. About a third of a million cards have been noted have so far been donated to the University of Maryland at College Park. The cards are located in the library system, university's library system, a building called Hornbake Library. The director of the special collections at the University of Maryland is Doug McElrath. It contains specialized collections such as their Marylandia rare books and many other things. Because of the university's proximity to, di to the District of Columbia, Columbia, a number of quasi-governmental agencies and organizations have arranged to have their records kept here at the University of Maryland campus. The National Trust for Historic Preservation is one of these. It was established after World War II for the preservation of American architecture and built environment. When the trust ran out of space for its library at, in the Stephen Decatur House, which is located on Lafayette Park across from the White House, the University of Maryland accepted its library collection, which included postcards. I've been a member and supporter of the National Trust for a long time, and now the trust is, is becoming a haven for my North American collection. About 300,000 postcards, all of these printed ones, have already been transferred to the University of Maryland for cataloging and digitizing. The cards were, are arranged alphabetically by state or province, and within each, alphabetically by counties and places within the counties. John Frelish of the Postcard Institute's staff developed a structural, a structured labeling format added by hand to divider cards for filing and refiling postcards. Not all, now not all of the postcards here in Myerstown are being sent to Maryland. Cards are filed either geographically or topically and within each segment, real photo post, and, and within each segment, and then the real photo postcards are kept separately and they're filed both geographically and topically. 
Only printed cars, only the printed cars from the geographical se segment have been transferred so far to Maryland, meaning, well, all of the 50 states, Canada and Central America are about to go when they're ready in, uh, in Delaware, in Maryland, in Maryland. Real photo postcards so far of the states are remaining here in Myerstown, and they're they're used quite steadily. Cards arranged topically from advertising and architecture through to zeppelins still are here in Myerstown, as well are as are drawers and drawers of cards arranged under publishers' names, such as Detroit's, Bill Hammond's, and Edward Mitchell's. With regard to how such a large collection was developed, my judgment is that all of you watching today already know, not just by buying at Woolworths. So I say thanks for the clubs that started the shows and also the dealers shows, the shows begun by dealers. For over eight decades, I have arranged postcards exchange postcards through the mails with collectors at least a thousand times. And after the ID Institute was incorporated, I have welcomed at least 3000 individuals who have visited because of, the, because of the Postcard Institute. Starting with a program for the local historical society out in Paul Paul, Michigan in the 1960s with an opaque projector incidentally, I have provided about 200 programs to organizations, ranging from local scout troops to senior citizens. And I have compiled 200 exhibit boards for these programs. And my many images, many of my cards have been included as illustrations in publications. However, the use of postcards from the Institute for which I am really most proud is that three times my World War I Harrisburg cars have been displayed in the rotunda of the Pennsylvania State Capitol. First in 1981, on the 75th anniversary of the building when its dome and artwork had severe damage and my card showed how brilliant it was back in 1906. Credit was given to me, or let's say, credit was given to my postcards for motivating the legislature to release funds for the capital's massive restoration that occurred by 2006 when it was when it was rededicated and I got a hug from Pennsylvania's Lieutenant Governor Catherine Baker Noel and a document calling me one of the Commonwealth's special treasures. We're at the end of my presentation. I have one more comment. It's been a pleasure today to share highlights from my lifetime with picture postcards and to have been given this opportunity to share information gleaned from the lives of those two pioneers of the 1930s and 1940s who blazed the trail into our wonderful world of postcard collecting. Thank you for listening. Oh, thank you, Don. Oh, that was you, terrific. Don. <laughs> Just really, really nice. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Oh, uh, you're talk very about welcome. It. Well, thank you so much. Dennis uh, McBurney is going to field any questions that we have. Uh, what do we have today, Dennis? Well, while uh, Don takes another uh, sip, um, <laughs> gets his breath. We really don't have any questions per se. I did look through this. We've got some nice comments, uh, nice comments. for everybody that has stuck around. We all thank uh, Don for his long dedication to postcards and for today's presentation and sharing some of the history. I uh, have been around postcards since 2000, but uh, there's a lot of the early history. I had no idea what it took to get there. The uh, we did have a couple of comments about uh, thank you for founding the Institute of American Deltaology. Um, 
Lynette Paulson really liked the neat multi-view card. I think that probably refers to the one in South Carolina Exposition. Uh, David, sorry, I pronounce his name, Frund or Friend, uh, says that uh, architect Frank Hall had about 40,000 carefully cataloged and curated architecture picks now at the Architecture Library of the City College of New York. That's good to know. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> your friend George Everhart has a shout out, yay for library schools. <laughs> and uh, I think we're all jealous that, that you again? were. What was it again that George? Yay for library schools. Oh, yay for library schools. <laughs> yes, yay for Wis on Wisconsin. Ah, oh, okay. And uh, Katie Clark and probably the rest of us jealous that you were able to buy Coast cards from your local Five and Dime. Uh, don't remember too many <laughs> yeah. Woolworths and area. Damaris, thanks you for a wonderful presentation. You are a special treasure. I've been a bit long. But I just uh, had so much to share with you. Yeah, you added a lot since we last went through. Is always different from everyone else's. That's right. right. That's right. So as far as the comments from the chat, I think that's it. So I'm going to go back on mute and let uh, you guys shut her down. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dennis. Very, very Thanks much. For, thank you all for coming to you my bet. presentation. Are, is there going to be a time for questions? Yes. Go ahead, David. Yeah, yeah. I uh, Whenever I go to a show, I look around the room and I look at the dealers and the collectors, and I think of how much incredible skill and wisdom and knowledge about American life, culture, postcards, publishing, and everything exists in this room. And I'm wondering about the University of Maryland Library. Do they have a... Uh, a vision, a mission, an idea of trying to gather in in some way, provide scholar support or collection home or something like that for the postcard uh, collecting world and scholarship attendant to it uh, so, so that it doesn't just evaporate. Uh, 10 and 12 years ago, when I linked up with the uh, University of Maryland Library because of my longtime membership in the in the Historic Preservation Group in Washington, uh, Doug McElrath, the director, pointed out they already were had received several large postcard collections. One I think was as large as twenty eight thousand cards, and they had more or less accepted the fact that since they agreed to operate not only just preserve but to service the National Trust for Historic Preservation Library in their special library building called Hornbeak, that they would pers they would think about becoming a center and st study center for postcards. They already had, I think, something like 50 or 60,000. Now they have about 450,000. And I'm not sure what the latest situation is down there, although I'm in con contact every few months with Doug. They were, are not accepting more donations right now since the pandemic started and they lost staff. But they have, at one point, Doug and I talked about this. Uh, this was 10 years ago when I really started sending huge annual shipments down there, like 40,000 cards and 50,000 cards a year. We, he more or less indicated that in a sense, among academic libraries, they had a, had accepted a, a responsibility for the humble picture postcard. So you'll have to contact Doug McElrath, the director. And of course I have all those ties so I can help you get to him for his answers. Yeah, I'd really like to because I look at Hal Ottaway's book on uh, the Denvik uh, cards as a checklist, and I know that particularly nowadays you can make a little book like that with with good reproduction and not too difficult. If there were a home for people to send mm -hmm. such books to one location, it could be a, a reference source that exists nowhere else. Right. Very true. That's right. 
So there I learned that from Michael, I learned that you might be visiting me sometime soon. <laughs> <laughs> Michael's ahead of the game, uh, always a leader. <laughs> yes. I'd be I'd love to come by. Yes. <laughs> I know you were trying to come by last summer when I was at my family reunion. And I'm the historian of the family, so I wasn't home. <laughs> what what family could have a better historian? Yeah. I hope to see you in your in your in your lair. Yes. It'd be nice to have you visit. Yeah. Okay. Any other any questions, other questions? Or comments? Yes. Anybody else? We thank you. Uh Please know that we will have this uh, posted on YouTube on their channel within the coming days. And uh, mm -hmm. stay tuned and uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll continue what we've uh, started here. We do have one uh, more question that showed up in chat. How no. do you see the future of postcards? Postcards are slowly disappearing and they might cease to exist one day. Do you think this will happen? I don't think so. There are always a minority of us, but in the millions, really, collecting postcards. Uh, more questions. Official figures of postcard production in the U.S. in the past few decades. No, I don't. I do not have that answer. Yeah, and the, the last question is along the same line. What was it in the 1970s, and what about now? Are there any positive signs? And I think anybody could unmute themselves and jump in on that discussion. Well, the bicentennial was such an emphasis. Yeah. For I uh, think if you you visit any large no, city, Boston, Chicago, you'd find that postcards are just not available on racks like they once were in the Boston area. You really have to dig to find a place where uh, postcards are available for tourists. Which is unfortunate, but and I was telling Dawn um, that in Chicago, I was there in April. You just can't find postcards. I, I should point out that I was recently involved in distributing show cards for our show here in Toronto, in downtown Toronto, and actually stumbled across across two places that were producing new postcards. One was producing them. He did one for a promotion for his store and another a promotion for his brother's book. Oh. And I found another store that is producing, actually two other stores that are both producing reproduction postcards of earlier views. Yeah, you do see those. So, yeah, yeah. And, I, I, and I was walking at one point through a kind of a touristy area. I did see racks of postcards. I mean, they, they, they obviously weren't my favorite views. You know, they were kind of new. They were kind of city hall, which is like 15 hall. years old. And, so on and so forth but we are still seeing them they still seem to be around although not to the uh, extent that they used to be well the politicians have discovered the medium of the postcard but the their postcards don't fit into our Big. cabinets <laughs> <laughs> no no they yeah. don't <clears throat> oh, I, I was talking to uh, david last night and i was mentioning uh, my visits to europe particularly to, to Paris, uh, which doesn't have a show right now, but they would invite a contemporary artist who was producing postcards and they were beautifully done. Here we have um, a few modern uh, productions. Yes. Matt Pierce is doing Halloween cards. Rick Gary, of course, is just prolific. Um, people use him for, uh, artwork for National Postcard Week and for other events. And um, I just don't know too many artists that are producing cards for just for postcards. postcards. Uh, but some of you might know that. Clarissa is one who would know who's producing cards. She collected the um, COVID cards and had plenty to say about that. Right. But if anyone else knows artists that are producing cards, that's something I'm interested in, and I know others would be. Aren't they still in, in France? Uh, Bernard Verry and uh, Patrick Ham? 
I don't know what's happening. Everything closed down with COVID and nothing has started up again. So I haven't spoken to anyone. But if you've heard more, I'm, I'll follow up on it. Well, I would think both of them would still be doing, but. Um, yes. Michael, yes. are you involved in a program that's producing postcards? Uh, not right now, no, not. No. Too bad. Okay, getting back to um, the future of postcards, the uh, postcrossing.com has over 800,000 members. If I estimate the average person is around 30 or 35 years old. Uh, most of them are young people, and there are a lot of older people who are still collecting postcards. and. Um, some of them are making their own. What is that uh, site again? Postcrossing.com. They send one postcard at a time with a stamp and a message. And we had to spend another evening with someone who likes to write. Uh, likes to write. He's a very good uh, writer and he likes to communicate and he uses postcards. So there are people who are looking for postcards, but uh, they're not at your local drugstore anymore. So, so yeah. I feed him cards I have. Well, if you go down to South Padre Island, almost every store has postcards, but it's a big <laughs> tourist area. And we don't go to the island in March because of all the college students that descend on us. <laughs> Tony oh, is the... Pennsylvania is my is the uh, photographer who's done quite a number of postcards for the Institute of American Deltaology. And if you come to Meyerstown and the main drugstore downtown has a huge rack of postcards. So there are some of us here, there, and are really working hard and steadily to see that the postcard is never forgotten. Lydia Pine's book on the mm. postcards also mentions it as the first what? The first tweets? Um, the first international, I internet. forget the title. Inter internet. Yes. Uh, Lyd Lydia media. Pine's new book two years ago. Yeah, she refers to social media. The, was the first international communication system. Mm -hmm. What's her name again? She has a she has a point there. I want Lydia to get a copy Pine. of the L Y D I A P Y N E. Yeah, she's a collector only because she inherited a collection. She is not uh, she doesn't seek out or say she knows postcards, but she understands the importance of them as a means of communication for the last 100 some odd years and makes a very good point. And she's a very good writer. One thing that's really interesting and going back in those old postcard magazines from the early 1940s and even to the present time is to see how collect interests have changed mm -hmm. in the 1940s large letter postcards were the number one collecting interest churches courthouses public buildings things like that were also very popular signed artists really didn't appear until the 1950s and became much more popular in the 60s Brundage Clapsaddle uh, those kinds of greeting type postcards and real photo postcards were really frowned upon. They just were not a collecting interest until I would say the 1970s. So, you know, related to that discussion and what's produced today, uh, you know, these collecting interests that have really changed over the years. Back in the 1940s, the few real photo postcards that happened to come across my in my donations at the time when I was a newspaper boy, I put them at the back of the boxes yeah, yeah, and they weren't yeah. colorful enough yeah, for my attention. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. I think it was in the 80s or 70s, whatever, when I was starting out uh, at the Metropolitan Club, uh, they were called black and whites. Yeah. And they were yes. dime to a well, quarter. Uh, there is a, 
yes. Yeah. There is a black and white printed card. And I find myself every once in a while explaining the difference and showing a visitor, this is a real photo postcard. This is a black and white. Look on the address side. That's where the clue is. Yeah, I find that with every new and good book that comes out, there's a rise in interest. The uh, large letter uh, collecting became much more important when uh, uh, Fred Tenney and uh, Kevin, can't think of oh, Kevin's huh. name, when their book came out. Bob Bogdan, I think, put a lot into making real photo postcards understandable. Um, Ken, uh, Flo not Ken Flory. Wilson. Uh, Ken, well, my good friend, Ken. Wilson. Wilson. Uh, he did a lot for attaching history to a postcard. Uh, well, he was using real photo postcards, but he gave you a reason to really look at a, po a, black, a real photo postcard and look at every detail and read the back of it for the message. And the message often was equally as important as the picture. So every uh, author has, I thought, what wonderful material in recent years. Okay, any other discussion or comments? This has been great. I like all of this. This was wonderful. If somebody wants to let me share for a moment, I can hold this up in front of my uh, camera and I can show you a, a brand new postcard. Please. Here we go. So this is, this is a book. And so this is what the fellow's brother had, um, which is designed as a postcard. And I'll show you the back in a second to promote this book. There we go. Very good. <laughs> yeah. And he has one for his store too, but he didn't have any extra ones. So yeah. I'll have to go back there when the snow melts. <laughs> there, are long, there are long time collectors of literary titles and such, but there's also, um, uh, narrow postcards as bookmarks. Oh yes, that's that right. uh, relate to literary, yeah, happenings. Nice. Uh, you have one for everyone. Pardon? You have one for everyone. <laughs> he gave me one. <laughs> I guess he wanted me to buy the rest. <laughs> it reminds me of uh, what was it? Uh, a few years back, somebody did a whole series of Pulp Fiction covers as postcards. And I, I, I remember buying a set of those. They're nice. dynamite. Yeah. So maybe they have to be less travel and historical related and uh, topical related. I don't know. Yeah. Well, the art museums of the world and it's all over America, to, even though I don't travel much anymore, they always had lots of postcards of art reproductions. Still do. I have thousands of those from, from National travels. Portrait Gallery in London. The whole wall. And this has been a delightful discussion following my program. Yeah. yeah. Dennis and Don, it used to be that uh, the Hershey Company did a number of, I mean, Dennis did books on the, the narrow cards. Are, are they doing anything anymore? Yeah, there are still some Hershey cards for the local tourists. They show up in some of the uh, uh, grocery stores and other outlets. So yeah, you can still get them. At one time, uh, I was told that the Hershey, Pennsylvania had the largest number of postcards issued for any small town in America. <laughs> that could be possible. No. Yeah, there really are a lot more. Once you start thinking about it and talking about it and sharing information, it's amazing how many postcards are still being, but they're not and where you used to find them yeah. in the general stores. Yeah. There are no more fine and dimes, so to speak. Right. And the, the drug stores, except the mine in Myerstown, True Care, <laughs> <laughs> don't seem to care for cards because as I've told by some drugstore owners, not mine in Myerstown, that people don't ask for them. Well, they don't ask for them because the tradition of having a postcard rack no longer is the case in the last half century. Yeah. 
unless you come to Meyerstown and to the true care. <laughs> You'll find a rack of postcards, not just in Meyerstown, but all over the area. Well, it's been delightful. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's maybe time to bring this to a close. And we thank you, Don. We thank you, Dennis, Alan, everybody. <clears throat>